sin más, voy a pasarle la palabra a Degan, que nos contará su visión sobre la agenda de localización. Bismillah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm speaking in English, so um, apologies for that, that I don't speak Spanish. It's, um, I was saying earlier to my colleagues um, that sometimes it's important to be humbled to be a foreign speaker in a foreign land because we forget how we come into other people's countries and we run these coordination meetings without allowing even the local people to get access to the meetings. And once they do get access through a very difficult process, these meetings are run in English, whether they're in Haiti, whether they're in Somalia, whether they're in Nepal, whether they're in Syria. So I think we forget the importance of language and how it can be um, a very disempowering process to be um, talking about your own country and your own people and helping them and you don't even understand the conversation. So um, I'm going to talk about um, a few things. And some of it is repeating, and I'm sorry for that, what Barbara and what was said earlier. And I think some of it hopefully will shed a little bit more light and expound on some of those issues a little more. So localization, what does it mean? First of all, I don't like this term. This term is very parochial and very loaded term. Um, I think Oxfam has done a tremendous tra job in trying to reframe this term and to be about local leadership. But I think it's more than that. It's not about local leadership. I think it's primarily around solidarity. And what we are saying in the Global South, and it's been said for many, many, many years, is that Northern NGOs have lost their moral compass. When I say that, it's shocking for Northerners to hear it. But there has to be, and going back to that great escape book and what was said earlier, what we feel in the South is that the whole aid system is very colonial in its makeup, in its structure, in its purpose, and in how it actually is perceived by local people and those who have the opportunity for and privilege to have good education are able to articulate these issues. That's how they perceive it. And when I say loss of moral compass, what I mean is, is that many of the issues that are affecting us in the global south are not humanitarian issues. They're political issues. And when I talk to people in DRC or in Haiti or in Syria, what they say is, more than money, please resolve three or five of the biggest conflicts in the world. Just resolve them. Don't give us more money. That will make us more happy than you giving us more money. It's not about the 25%. Everybody's so focused on the 25%. It's almost... Um, you know, camouflaging the bigger issue. The bigger issue is we need solidarity from the global north in turning back to the roots of what created these northern institutions. These were civil society organizations, not professional NGOs who became, who got into this business, this com corporatization of the aid sector where they're now so focused in writing reports and, 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 and collecting data and metrics for the donors that they have forgotten what it means to be a civil society organization, which is being, you know, confronting your governments in how they are complicit in political problems that are causing the crisis in our countries. Yeah? This is about shifting the power. It's about northern NGOs taking responsibility and taking responsibility ultimately is part of solidarity. And so uh, this is why I don't like the term, because I think the term is, is pushing responsibility onto us again. 
It's saying, you local actors want more money, how do we get you more money? Yeah? It's not saying, we in the North, what have we done wrong, and what should we be doing in the future? You know, it's shocking that Oxfam is one of the remaining big five organizations that has campaigning as part of its root core mandate. That's shocking. That is shocking. You know, everybody should be uh, campaigning and doing advocacy in the global north. It should be their primary focus. So when we say localization, everybody says, uh, well, not everybody, there are a lot of great allies, but one of the biggest fear is competition. Are you taking more money away from us? We're saying, yes, we'll take more money away, but you also redefine a relevant space for yourself in going back to your roots as solidarity organizations that address the political crisis, which means there is space. It's about redefining the space and your relevancy in the future and going back to your roots. If that question of roots and solidarity is answered properly, if there's a good answer for that question, money becomes inconsequential. Yeah? But when you don't answer that question, then it becomes, it's seen as a competition. And it's not about money. So having said that, let me go back to the, the current framing of the localization agenda, which is very much around money. And money is important, but money, as I said, is not everything. So according to the current framing of the localization agenda or the local leadership agenda, I'll just try to use local leadership going forward because I think it's less loaded. Um, what does it mean to us? I've already talked about the solidarity angle, but I also am talking about how we in the, in the South can develop a strong civil society. How is it, we, you know, there was a lot of talk around corruption and those uh, numbers, which are obviously very worrying trend, but the question that isn't answered oftentimes is, okay, first, let's go back in history. A hundred years ago, many of the countries on that list would have been European. Yeah? We forget that. There's selective amnesia here in this conversation. We forget that northern NGOs are professionalized and corporatized entities today with high quality brand names because there has been a purposeful investment by their northern donor countries in them. There has been purposeful, strategic, multi-year funding, predictable funding given to them by their northern government donors. You don't all of a sudden create a Save the Children. You don't all of a sudden create an Oxfam. Those brands were created because Northern donors said these organizations are important in how we do our work and serve our aid model into the global south and we need them as partners, so therefore we're gonna invest in them, yeah? So we in the south are somehow expected to meet the standards of the Oxfams and the Save Children over, overnight. That doesn't happen. There is an inherent risk that existed 100 years ago and that inherent for northern NGOs and that inherent risk will be there now for southern NGOs. Risk is there. We cannot avoid risk. As of today, there is five or four American INGOs, American organizations, who are being investigated by the US government inspector general for the Syria response because of fraud. But when we talk about corruption, it's always synonymous with the South. Yeah? There are two huge American entities receiving billions of dollars by the US government. One was AED that went out of business about five years ago. The second is IRD that went out of business. But we forget about that, you see? So in terms of scale, when you are a $1 billion organization and you commit through your massive supply chain that it's impossible to, to check every single dollar where it goes. Because to me, size is a problem. 
scale is a problem. Everybody thinks scale is a good thing. Scale is not a good thing. Yeah, and I will tell you why in a minute. But when you are a massive $1 billion organization, there is no way you can con confirm and 100% authenticate that every dollar you spend in 50 or 100 countries around the world is being spent in the way it's intended to. It's impossible. It's a fighting battle. You're like a firefighter. It's an impossible task. So what you do is you do a lot of covering up and lots of nice reports for the donor to keep them happy. Now, in the South, if we are going to be able to meet due diligence requirements of northern donors, which we can, Adesso is an example of that. We were, when I started the organization in 2003, uh, it was founded by my mother. Um, I joined her in 2003. And we were only getting one, we had one project with one donor, Oxfam Novib, working in one region in Somalia. Now, we are over $25 million organization working in three countries in East and Horn of Africa, implementing as large as $45 million USAID contracts. That didn't happen overnight. What worked for a DESO model and what didn't work in terms of partnerships? What worked was Oxfam Novib saying to us, what do you need? And we said, we need unrestricted funding. We need an office in Nairobi to be able to have access to the donors and not be relegated to Somalia where we cannot come to the Nairobi donor meetings. We need to be in Nairobi because that's where all the donors are. And all the Somali NGOs, majority of them were in Somalia at that time. We were one of the few Somali NGOs that had presence in Nairobi. And they, fund, they funded that, they financed that for about five years. They gave us a 25% overhead rate for five years, yeah? To allow us to maintain that office. They said, what else do you need? We said, we need a financial software system. They said, great, we'll give it to you. It was basically, it was a partnership that was around how do we help you based on your needs, not based on what we think you need, based on this concept of trainings, a lot of trainings, we've been trained to death, we don't need any more trainings, yeah? It's about institutional investment, it's about building long-term partnership and building strong institutions that can handle the due diligence requirements. That kind of investment never happens rarely happens. And I'm sorry to hear that the Oxfam Novib model is dying because their unrestricted funding from the Dutch government is no longer there. And so they had to decentralize and come to the south and open offices which became more expensive and started to becoming more competitive. They had to compete for donor funding. So uh, the donors are also creating, uh, actually shooting that, that, that kind of real successful model in the foot by forcing organizations to create expensive structures in the South so they can compete for that money. That unrestricted money that I was telling you about, that multi-year investment that Northern donors were given, that funding is what allowed Novib to do that. So now, where are we in Somalia or South Sudan where we also work? In Somalia in 25 years, there are not more than 10, maximum 15 local organizations that can absorb $200,000, $300,000 without any problem. That to me is a tragedy. 25 years and all we have is a dozen strong local organizations. In South Sudan, those numbers are even more dismal, probably half a dozen. And everybody works with the same group. And what does that do? That weakens their capacity. Because now there's a bigger crisis, a bigger response, so everybody works with the same group and they're all subcontracting them. There's no real investment in their capacity. And so when a problem happens, when one of their staff commits corruption, what happens? That organization that everybody has been working with for 10, 15 years is blacklisted and goes out of business. Rather than saying, we've invested in this organization, we've, get, we've built it up this far, how do we help it to weather this reputational problem? 
That rarely happens. There is 100% risk transference. The local organizations are the ones who are working in inaccessible, insecure environments, risking their lives every single day, doing 70-80% of the humanitarian response. 100% reputational transfer. If there's a matter or an issue of corruption, it is very, very, very. What happened in Syria is happening in Syria, has been going on for many, many years. And it happens all over the world. Transparency International just issued a very, very uh, damning report about South Somalia corruption. And guess what? It's not all local organizations. UN agencies, donors, INGOs, everybody. So um, now what, as near, we said, we can't just be passive in the situation and let this all happen around us. The idea came to me, I was in an ICVA conference in 2010. I had never heard of ICVA before then. I didn't even know who they, who they were. Um, that tells you how relevant this international aid system is on the ground. I was too busy working in Somalia. I didn't go to these international forums. I had never heard of the Interagency Standing Committee before 2009. I had never heard of ICVA before 2010. None of these inf systems or mechanisms were really relevant to my day. Of course, now I understand how these, the system was making decisions about Somalia without me knowing it. So I was in this conference and I just kept hearing all the Southerners, brown and black people sitting in the corner together complaining. And they were talking about the same thing. Ikfa, we're just not happy. We don't feel that it represents us. We're just, our issues are not being constantly addressed, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we're now members of Ikfa, and I do see a role for Ikfa. But Ikfa wasn't founded based on Southern mandate, Southern principles, issues for Southern organizations. That's not where, how it was formed. History is important. History dictates the, 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 the current uh, situation. So, um, then I said to them, well, why are we always asking for them to change? Why don't we form our own network? And why don't we come together in solidarity across the global south and advocate ourselves for our own issues? Why are we waiting for a seat at the table constantly? And that's how this idea of NIR came about. It was just a recognition that enough was enough. We can't keep complaining and talking about the same issues over and over and over again. And we can't, you know, power never concedes. You know, power is taken. And we can't just constantly wait and be beggars in a room in an international conference being uh, asking for breadcrumbs to be thrown our way. And so NIR was formed because of that ideal. And we said we have to work on four issues. The four issues are around advocacy. How do we get a seat at the table in international decision-making forums, both such as the Interagency Standing Committee, which is very centralized in New York and Geneva. All the decisions about the Nepal response, South Sudan response are made in those countries and not in South Sudan with the national governments or the local NGOs in the local language. Um, and also, how do we get seats at the table and national humanitarian country teams? You know, again, another very insular, uh, northern-dominated, UN-dominated system. So second, capacity strengthening. How do we invest long-term strategically in, in, in developing institutions and leadership in those institutions? And third, financing. Obviously, we know about the numbers, 0.2, 0.3% uh, of humanitarian funding goes directly to local organizations. And in development sector, it's not much better. It's about 4%. So how do we get more money directly into the hands of local organizations? And the last one is around research and learning and creating a stronger evidence base for issues that are important for us but not just the issues about how do we communicate better in the South and make sure that international and national media highlights our efforts and our response. Nepal earthquake happens. 
Who's New York Times and The Guardian talking about? They're not talking about the local Nepalese NGOs that were the first responders doing the heavy lifting. They're not talking about them. They're talking about the big brands. You see? So how do we, not only in our national media, but in the international media, how do we also help these national organizations communicate better? Because that's also the thing that's least invested in. When you talk to a local organization, they say, they don't talk about financial systems and HR systems. They say, we need communications, advocacy, and fundraising capacity. Those are the things that are least invested in. Why? Because they know they have to fundraise, and that fundraising will allow them to increase their capacity. Financing and capacity are interlinked. You cannot develop in a vacuum. It's like asking someone, learn how to swim, but don't go in the pool. You know, you cannot ask an NGO to develop its capacity without giving them funding to implement programs. Because it does two purposes. It is the money that you give them, especially the 10% or the 7% overhead that allows them to invest in their capacity. As I said, there is no northern or southern donor giving us unrestricted money for five years, 10 years. The investment that has happened for the past 50, 60 years with northern entities hasn't happened in the south and will never happen. We are, we are, we are realistic. We know what was, what's going to happen. So that little overhead is critical for that capacity strengthening. And secondly, it is by learning, by doing that you learn. It is by our first large grant was from Oxfam Novib because it was the drought. We proposed cash transfers. Everybody thought we were crazy to propose doing cash in Somalia. Everybody said the cash will be spent for guns and it will be spent for Mira, Qad. It's a drug. And we said, no, that's not what's going to happen. And it's the right thing to do for many reasons. I won't go into the reasons why we proposed cash. Nobody believed us. Everybody thought we were crazy. The only one who was willing to give us, take that risk on us was Oxfam Novib. They gave us 700,000 euros, almost a million dollars at that time to implement our first large cash transfer. And it was the largest cash transfer ever done in Somalia at that time. Now, if KPMG or Price Waterhouse came to Adesso and said, can Adesso absorb that 700,000 euros? We would have gotten a big fat F. Our due diligence systems, I will be honest and tell you, they were very weak. They were very weak. Yeah? But we got that $700,000 out the window into the hands of beneficiaries within less than 30 days. We did the trainings, we did the registration, we did the distribution, and we did post-distribution monitoring surveys. We developed systems that had never been developed because nobody knew how to do cash transfers. Nobody. We did the first systems, the first guidelines, the first trainings, all of these things that we ended up later training UN agencies Training INGOs, Adesso was training INGOs in Liberia, in Ethiopia, on cash transfers. But in 2003, nobody knew how to do it well. There was only one guideline developed by Oxfam at that time, and it wasn't practical for field practi practitioners. So we had to develop all these tools from the beginning, and we did that all in 30 days. And because we knew we were going to be reviewed and this was going to be scrutinized, we said, Ocha, please come and do a post-monitoring post survey. Because we wanted to prove that we did the right thing, that we weren't corrupt, that the money went into the hands of beneficiaries, and, and that cash actually made sense. Ocha came. They're not an implementer. They had never done that in, before in Somalia. And they came and they found out that there was a 97% success targeting. 97%. I don't know too many INGOs that have those successful targeting. Why? Because we know the communities. We know who the vulnerable is and we know who isn't. We have intimate understanding of the communities that no NGO based in Nairobi or London has. And that has a value, has a price. But it's not quantified. 
There's no metrics for it. There's no dollar value on that. There's the ability of Syrian NGOs in Aleppo, who's responding? There's no ING on the ground. It's only Syrians who are responding. But their ability to maneuver and get access in the most insecure environment in the world right now is not, there's no price tag on it. There's no value to it. We say corruption, we say risk. The fact that they're dying every single day doing that, we don't put a value on it. So there has to be a metrics, a change in how we evaluate and we, um, we, we, we quantify capacity. It can't be capacity around reporting and due diligence. A friend of mine from the Leadership Council of NIR in Bangladesh says, there is too much over-reliance in the West on accounts ability. That's the books, the due diligence, the paperwork, the reporting, accounts ability, and very little priority of accountability to communities and the people. Talk to the people, ask them, are you happy with Adesso? Are you happy with Coast? Are you happy with that Syrian NGO? They would probably say yes, the majority of them will. But ask them, are you, do you know what that INGO has done in your location? Are they in Aleppo? They will say, we've never heard of them. You see, but they're reporting in Damascus or in Lebanon, in Beirut or Amman, that they have responded in Aleppo. But how many people were in that supply chain? And who does that local NGO, I mean that community know? It's that local NGO. That's the one, that's the face they see. They don't see that INGO sitting in Amman, sitting in Nairobi. So financing, how do we get more money into the hands of local communities and local actors? So as near, we have been very propos propositional. The 20%, by the way, came from us. As part of the WHS process, we were able to mobilize. Actually, we didn't do much mobilization. To be honest with you, the momentum was there. The WHS secretariat did not expect the, the strong and overwhelming sentiment, because they were doing consultations all over the world. The world means primarily in the global south. Not Europe only. I don't think there were actually any consultations except maybe two in the, in the north. And the overwhelming issue that consistently came out was this issue of local leadership. There was one issue that constantly came out of the consultations was local leadership. And so they couldn't ignore it. They had to give it space. They had to allow it, you know, so what we, we captured, we saw that and we captured it and we said we have to push for certain issues. We have to be specific. What do we want? And that's when we said we want 20% by 2020. Of course, a lot of our members said, why 20%? We're doing 70, 80% of the work. But we said we have to be realistic. Donors are giving 0.2% right now. There is no way they're going to give 60, 70, 80% in by 2020. And many donors said to us, 20% is very difficult for us to meet. Anyways, the grand bargain, we weren't part of that conversation, those discussions. We were excluded. We asked for to be part of it. We were excluded again. Who represented the South? Interaction, an American network, and ICVA. So again, decisions are being made around issues that we proposed. The 20% came from us. And we're not even part of those discussions. But we had the right people in the room. And those right people did the right thing. And not everybody, but a lot of good people were in that room. And we finally got 25%. We didn't expect it. We thought it wouldn't happen, but we got 25%. So how do we get donors to meet that 25% commitment? We are saying that that 25% commitment can only be met. I mean, they, there are other ways of doing it, but I don't see how it can be done in the scale of 25%. I don't know how. Through the creation of national pooled funds. The CHF, the UN-led pooled funds model, is a disaster. Majority of the recipients are UN agencies themselves, so they're lining their own pockets, or northern NGOs. Um, 
So if we are serious about this commitment, we are proposing that national pooled funds, which are national brands that people in that country appreciate and recognize, be established. That are managed by local NGOs themselves. You'll have a board that's elected by the country members. And it's only allowed for national NGOs to receive that money. And going further, we suggest that this national pooled fund have different models, meaning you can have a traditional model with DFID and uh, USAID or the Spanish government being donors to it, but we also want to demonstrate and show that there's a lot of money in the South. We want pooled funds in Kenya, in India, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in countries where there's a lot of wealth and a lot of money. Why do we know that? Well, we see INGOs having affiliates in these countries and they are raising, I think I heard someone saying that World Vision is getting 30% of its global funding now from the Global South. Three, four billion dollar agency, one billion, one agency taking one billion alone from the Global South. We have serious issues with with the southernization of international organizations. And I'll talk about that as well in a second. But, but that proves to me that at this point, this hypothesis, this theory is not a theory. There is a lot of money in the South. And how do we tap into that money? Well, I don't think Start Network is going to tap into that funding. And I don't think uh, the UN managed pool funds will know how to tap into that, to that funding. I think it is a local brand that has been created for the local agencies will be able to do the marketing and the communications to be able to tap into that. We need to organize and formalize the giving that already exists in the South. And some of it is going to Northern brands and we need to be showing them an alternative model. We would love to have DFID come in into Kenya and say, for every dollar raised, we will match it. It's possible, it's been done. In Kenya during 2012 drought, or 2011, 2012 drought, Kenya Red Cross raised $10 million in less than a month from the public and private sector. $10 million, one agency in one month. So there is potential, there's huge potential. It was called the Kenyans for Kenya campaign. It was very, very well branded and well thought of. So, um, so what we're saying is we need to be creative and we need to also sh demonstrate our independence as the South. There's money in the South that can be generated and how can we use this opportunity of these national pooled funds to be able to do that. Now, the important thing that the other funds cannot do is that you have local organizations who have different levels of capacity. You have an organization that can only absorb $5,000. Is a UN managed pooled fund or a start fund able to give it out a $5,000 grant? No, they can't. So how do we give that $5,000 to a $5,000 organization but develop a plan to invest in that organization so that over time they can absorb 50,000, 100,000, half a million. There has to be strategic and long-term investment in that $5,000 organization, and that is what the fund will do. So that over time they can become a million dollar organization and we can graduate them from the fund. And then once we graduate them from the fund, we can introduce them to Northern donors, to Ford Foundation, to Rockefeller, to DFID, or whoever it may be, and say, these guys no longer need intermediaries. You can fund them directly. Because donors say two things to us. They say, we don't have the administrative capacity to give out small grants to a thousand NGOs, right? They wanna write big checks. So write a big check to the fund, and that fund will distribute that big check in, small, in smaller tranches. Then the second thing that they say I, is that we don't know who's out there. We don't know who's legitimate and who's not. Well, the fund will do a capacity assessment. The fund will identify the legitimate and, 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 and weed out the non-legitimate agencies. 
and we will invest in them over time through capacity strengthening, through unrestricted funding, and all these other mechanisms so that they can absorb more money over time. And then they don't any longer need intermediaries. And we can say to you, these guys have a track record, please deal with them. They don't need us any longer. And that is where we should be. That is how you create a civil society in that country. We talk about the freedoms that are being lost and corruption and all of these things. But if it's no investment in civil society, it is the northern NGOs that allowed Europe and America. It is that civil society movement that changed the government so that they were more accountable. Yeah? But we don't invest in the Southern civil society. How do we expect the Kenyan civil society to change and pass laws and policies, uh, to help push for laws and policies that hold government people accountable on corruption if there hasn't been that long-term investment in them? So we're expecting them to do the miracles, you know, because one of the th issues about shrinking of civil society space a lot of northern donors and northern governments say, why aren't you doing something about this? But then what, ha what has been done for them? Where's the investment in their capacity? Kenya is a very rich country. It's a very developed country. There are thousands of NGOs in Kenya. There's thousands of donor money going in, billions of dollars of uh, northern money going to Kenya. But there is no national coordination mechanism for civil society in Kenya. There's none. They're divided, this group, this group, health sector, this group. There's no united network. And that's just, to me, is a tragedy. That's outrageous. So when we have problems with the NGO board who's doing corrupt things and wants money from us, and we say no, and in retaliation he says, I'm going to uh, malign your reputation in the media, or I'm going to remove your registration and not allow you to re-register, and you call a meeting and you say, who do, we, who do I talk to? There is not one coordination body for all civil society. There's not one united mechanism. That's a problem in my opinion. So on the one hand, we're asked to do miracles. We're asked to turn the impossible into the possible. And at the same time, our capacity is not invested in. And then going back to the Charter for Change and this issue of um, capacity. Northern NGOs, I'm sorry to say, and UN agencies are complicit in capacity erosion. Why do I say that? In Nepal, one of our local partners said that in one month, 75% of their staff were taken because they couldn't pay salaries to compete with this international market that came in Nepal. 75%. The same time, UNHCR and other INGOs give zero overhead. They don't give any overhead. So you're not given overhead to compensate your staff in a good way so you can compete. And then when a crisis happens, the staff in the strong organizations are poached constantly. This was one of the issues that came out in the Charter for Change. So when CAFOD asked us, what are the issues you guys are dealing with? We said, one of the biggest problem is capacity erosion. We're told you don't have the capacity. We're told you cannot meet due diligence requirements. But on the other hand, when we do have capacity or the little capacity that we have and we've invested in, it's constantly eroded by these actions. You see? It's, kind, it's almost, this is why I used the, the very, very strong language of, of colonial. It almost feels like it's a purposeful effort to make sure that local NGOs don't succeed. That's how it feels like. Yeah? This is what I'm talking about. You're told to go and learn how to swim, but you can't go into the pool. Your hands are constantly tied. And so there has to be a very... A uh, strong reflection on the part of donors and northern NGOs about whether they are willing to dismantle systematically the system that is doing everything possible to not empower local actors. It requires courage. It requires serious courage. I will end with just the last thing around scale. 
scale. Um, I said this to someone in Oslo yesterday, two days ago, um, at the NORAD conference that I said, I don't believe in scale, and they all, just their mouth dropped. Why do I say that? I'll give you a very good example. Adesso has become almost as big as a $30 million organization at the height of the famine in Somalia. Where has Adesso come in its roots? And this, I see that southern NGOs are at risk of becoming corporatized, industrialized, professionalized. What is the standard for success? The standard for success is how big your annual turnover is and how many countries you work in. And that's the standard of success that I bought into. When I came and took over the executive director role for my mother who retired in 2006, for me, I was just focused on getting one big major donor to fund Adesso. When, that first, when I broke through that first glass ceiling and I got EC funding, then I was like, okay, now let's go to USAID. How do we break through the other glass ceiling? I broke through that glass ceiling. Then I was like, okay, now let's expand within Somalia. And then I expanded within Somalia. Then I was like, okay, our brothers and sisters across the Kenya border, you know, we have learned a lot and we do a lot of good things. Let's help them. We, we expanded to northern Kenya. Then we said, okay, let's go to South Sudan. There's need there. There's a problem. We became a typical expansionist, imperialistic NGO. Yeah? We have never along that process said, no, let's not expand. Let's see how, in my little way, because I don't have the resources. I don't have the trust of the donors. I have a reputational risk. We have actually tried to work with other local organizations. And when problems occur, we are the ones who experience that problem as a DESO. I've been in a situation where another INGO had problems with the same time in the same locations, and their corruption issue was covered up by the donor. No big deal. I was transparent, and I said, that local organization, I think there's corruption problem. We were almost blacklisted. It took us three years to recover our reputation because we were honest. We said, let's talk about corruption openly. Let's everybody put it out of there. The INGO covered it up. The donor was complicit, allowed it to be covered up, and they continued to get more and more and more funding. We can't even have an honest conversation around corruption, let alone how do you address it. So what I, going back to the scale issue, the roots that we have with the communities, what makes us an activist organization, what makes us understand the root problems of the communities that we work in. We're losing it. I don't have intimate knowledge of the South Sudanese community to be able to understand what needs to happen and how I mobilize other South Sudanese civil society. I don't have that level of connection and knowledge. And for me to say that I do, it's just arrogant. It's egotistical. And so if we are practicing what we preach, and if we really are trying to become, going back to our roots of becoming solidarity organizations, we can't do the same thing that INGOs do, of becoming expansionist, because that is the current success model. We have to create other successful models. We have to demonstrate and show that it's possible to be successful and to be recognized and to be lauded and to be funded for being an organization that works in just one village just in one village, one location, one community, but does work excellent in that one community. So we, we have to create those models and we have to recognize and appreciate those models because it won't just happen in a vacuum. I will end, well, I, I, I won't go on. I've taken too much time. I wanted to talk about neutrality and conflict in the MSF's position, but I won't do that. I will um, let others do that, but I have obviously very strong <laughs> opinions about that. Um, it's very hard for me to be, um, how should I say, uh, toned in my opinions. They're either strong <laughs> or none. <laughs> so, um, but I will maybe let my colleagues talk about that issue as well. I will just end there for now. Thank you.